Well, welcome back for the second day as we take a look at the Puritans, specifically the Puritans in America. What I want to do today is I want to talk about what a Puritan is or was, and also talk a little bit about the background of the backstory behind the Puritans. Let's start out with what a Puritan is. Let's see if we can kind of define a Puritan. And to start this out, I'm actually going to give you a quote by a famous American author and journalist. His name was H.L. Mencken. And Mencken was not exactly someone who necessarily believed in the gospel, but Mencken was someone who looked at Christians and saw some of our silliness and was able to kind of reflect it back to us, especially when we get serious about ourselves. But one of the things that Mencken said about Puritans was this. He said, a Puritan is someone who is fearful of someone somewhere else having fun and will do everything to stop it. That's kind of the typical view of Puritans. The Puritans were these grumpy people who always wore black and somehow the sky over them was always cloudy and these people never liked to smile, they never laughed, they just sat around all day, I don't know, reading their Bible or something like that, but only reading the really, uh, the, the really darker parts or the really sad parts of the Bible, the parts that kind of remind you of how dire and dark you are. The truth about the Puritans is that's not really accurate. If you go back and look at what they wore, for example, they wore bright colors. In fact, they often were lovers of great clothing. I think this is the day and age where men would wear lace, which may sound a little strange to you now here in the 21st century, but the Puritans loved things like expensive, finely woven lace. And it wasn't the fact that they were somehow obsessed with uh, things of finer taste. It just means that they loved things that were beautiful. The Puritans were known for having feasts. After all, it was the Puritans, for example, who founded that Feast of Thanksgiving along with the natives here in the New World. Uh, the Puritans were a people who loved things like beautiful poetry or beautiful paintings. The very first poet in the New World was a Puritan woman by the name of Anne Bradstreet. The Puritans also loved things like beer. Uh, the largest cargo that they brought over on the Mayflower was a huge barrel of beer, partly because it would keep well and also partly because they use that as a form of celebration. It's one of the things that actually kept half of them alive during that first winter over here in the New World. So in reality, the Puritans weren't this, this people group that were somehow always dour, somehow always sad and depressed. The Puritans just understood the pattern of life. In other words, they understood the fact that you have times of confession, you have times where you fast, but you also have times where you profess that God has done all of these things for us. He's taken away the penalty of sin, which is death. And you also celebrate that. So kind of like our year, we have times where we fast and we have times where we feast. We have times where we work and we have times where we rest. The Puritans understood that problem, or that pattern rather, not a problem, but that, uh, that pattern very well, and they tried to adapt it constantly. To give you a simple definition of what a Puritan is, as I've shown you what a Puritan is not, a Puritan was simply someone who wanted to purify the church. That's where they got their name. They took a look at the way that worship was being done in the Church of England. They, take a look, they took a look at the way that sermons were allowed to be preached, because at this time, the king or queen of England always had their hand on the church. In fact, they were seen as the head of the church. And they could control how worship was done. They could control what you said from the pulpit as a pastor. And they could even control what parts of the Bible were in English versus what parts were still in Latin. So the Puritans took a look at the way that the king or the queen controlled the church, and they thought that that really was not a good model. They thought it was a bad model to have the same person in charge of the state and in charge of the church. And that actually was a common model for all Protestants. It was always this idea that the state and the church should be ruled by different people. That's what it originally meant by separation of church and state. You don't want the same people in charge of both because it's too much power. It's too much influence. And there's no way to check them if they go wrong. However, you do want truth and beauty and goodness to be informing both the church and the state. That really was always there as an idea in the way the Puritans thought, and the way the Protestants thought, and the way the early Americans thought as well. But even so, let's talk a little bit more about the Puritans and defining who they are. The Puritans were a people who believed in what we call a theocracy. 
which you see up here on the screen right now. And a theocracy, in its most literal sense, means a rule by God. Now, obviously, God doesn't come down here and reign on a throne and physically hand out decisions or laws or court case decisions, etc. Instead, the idea was is that the laws that are found in his scripture or the principles found in his scripture, those should be applied to the laws today. Now, the problem is, how do you interpret it? The problem is, how do you take a look at Old Testament laws and know which ones or how to use them in the modern era? And that's still an area of debate. It's not like there's one easy way to look at it. But we do know a few things. We do know, for example, that in the Psalms, for example, the psalmist often says, I delight in the law of God. And the reason why we would delight in God's law from the Old Testament is because it shows us what his character is. The other thing that we know is we know that Christ, when he came, he fulfilled the law. He actually obeyed the law perfectly, and he took away the penalty of the law from, or for, well, from us, really. And not only that, but we know that he came not to abolish the law. He didn't can't come to get rid of it. And so the law is something that we still have. For example, we have the Ten Commandments, which are still our basic guideline for how we should live. But at the same time, we understand that we can't fulfill those perfectly. But still, the point is this. The Puritans asked the question, okay, if we're going to build this city on a hill, how should our laws, how should our system of the way that we live, how should it actually properly reflect the Ten Commandments? Sometimes the Puritans did this very well. They often were a very just people. Sometimes they didn't do so well, such as the time when they hung Quakers, or the time when they executed witches who probably weren't even witches, or the fact that the Puritans didn't celebrate Christmas. They thought that Christmas, uh, even way before now, they thought that Christmas was somehow too pagan or too commercial. So therefore they didn't celebrate it and they made it illegal to actually celebrate Christmas. So you have some of these exceptions with the Puritans, but if we focus on those, we'll miss the rich story that's here with the Puritans. Now, another thing I want to say about the Puritans is the Puritans formed what we call a hybrid. They kind of mixed theocracy with democracy, meaning the Puritans had this very strong idea that while it's true that God appoints certain people to be in charge of the government, and those people essentially have his backing, so to speak, because they are officers of the law, at the same time, those people are also chosen or elected by the people. And those people can be recalled. They can be taken out of office by the people. So while they have this incredible authority that is given to them from God, they also have an authority that is rooted in the people they govern over. And so therefore, no king, no governor, no lawmaker is completely on his own. He also is there as a servant to the people. The Puritans really innovated that idea, and it made them incredible. Now, one more thing I want to mention about the Puritans today, kind of give you a backstory to understanding them, is the Puritans came out of the Reformation. This was uh, the Reformation that was really brought about by the works and by the, the speeches and the sermons given by men like Martin Luther or John Calvin. Now, we can sum up the Reformation in a few Latin phrases, and these are sometimes called the solas. For example, we can use the, Latin, the Reformational phrase sola fide, which means by faith alone. One of the things Reformation understood was that it's faith alone through grace. In fact, they had another phrase called sola gratia. And it's these things, faith by grace alone, that actually saves us, that actually redeems us. So that means you don't have to do good works to save yourself. It's not like you have to do certain good deeds in order to get to heaven or to be with God for all eternity. Another thing the Great Reformation believed was what we call solus Christus, which means by Christ alone we're actually saved. That means that you don't have to go through a priest or go through a pope to actually get to God. You can go directly to him because Christ has opened that door already. Another one of the solas I want you to know was sola scriptura, which means by the scriptures alone. This whole concept was the fact that the scriptures alone contain no errors, 
The scriptures alone were the voice of God accomplished through various men throughout a long period of history. And this was everything that God was revealing to us about himself, about us, and about how we relate to him. And so the Puritans took all of these ideas of Reformation and they tried to use them in England where the Reformation came. Now, in order to understand that, we need to take a look at some of the rulers at this time. This is going to be kind of a long list here, but I'll try to make it as much of a summary as I can for you, because this is really complex history that we're diving into at the moment. But a character I want you to note was a man by the name of Henry VIII. You might have heard of Henry VIII because he had six wives, who most of them uh, actually did not outlive him. They were either divorced or, worse, they were beheaded. But Henry VIII, besides having lots of wives and besides being a man who uh, ate a lot, uh, was a man who was very greedy for power. And one of the ways he realized he could have power was he realized that if he became a champion of the Reformation and said that he believed in these solas, he actually would have an excuse to take the church away from the church in Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, and put it under his own power as king. So Henry VIII did that. He tore the Church of England away from the Church of Rome, and he made himself the head of that entire church. Gave him an incredible amount of power. Well, Henry VIII, like all other men, despite having all this power, had to die eventually, and he did. He was succeeded by his children. Now, his first child that succeeded him was Edward VI. Edward VI was actually someone who really believed in the solas and really tried to practice those. He actually tried to make it so that you could actually worship in English. People still worship in Latin, and because so many people didn't know Latin, they didn't know what they were saying. So it was very difficult to worship the one true God if you don't know what you're actually saying to him. But Edward VI did not last very long. He was succeeded by his sister, Mary I, who's better known to history as Bloody Mary, she was against the Reformation and for the Roman Catholic Church and actually put to death several of the Reformational figures or Puritans that were in England at the time. But she didn't last long either. Eventually she passed and her half-sister Elizabeth I came to the throne. And she actually reigned on the throne for many, many years, was one of the great queens or monarchs of all time in the nation of England. And Elizabeth I made it so the Puritans were essentially allowed to be and allowed to worship, but she performed what was called the Great Compromise. And so, for example, things like the Ten Commandments could be actually translated into English and put that way into the worship service, but most of the rest of Scripture could not. And so, therefore, people only had this kind of partial gospel. They could partially worship God in a language they understood, and partially they could not. But then in her reign, and then following through the reigns of men like James I, who came after her, and then his son Charles I, who eventually lost his head, uh, through the reigns of men like those, they all tried to control the church. And one of the ways they did this was you had to have a license to preach. You had to have a license to be a pastor. And if you said things that the state didn't like, or if you tried to reveal the truth of the scriptures too much, you could be arrested. You could even, in some cases, be put to death. And so that's what the Puritans were facing. The Puritans wanted to purify that. They wanted to get rid of state control over what the church could say or not say. They didn't believe that was actual freedom, nor did they believe that actually allowed the gospel to go forth freely. What's incredible is that men like King James, for example, tried to control power by controlling the scripture itself. It was King James, for example, who authorized the Bible to be translated completely into English. It's called the King James Version. The only problem was is that it completely backfired on him because it gave people the actual truth in a language they could all read. Well, we'll talk about the Puritans in America and some of the specific characters tomorrow.